and it, it would cost at least three times as less. Why don't we do it? Well, you know why? Because people don't like paying for things like that. People would rather put their money into, you know, a strong fire and heavy stuff on it. I'm just saying, studies have shown this. I'm not making this up. It's interesting. The logic of things. Okay, so also Immigration Act of 1965, President Johnson made it easier for folks to come to the United States, especially from Central and South America. Now, when I say Central America, I'm, I'm not talking just about Central America, but Mexico as well. And as a result, by loosening some of those restrictions, you guys know what has happened. Um, in America, we um, we are seeing the, the, the growth of Mexican Americans. If you're a Mexican American today, it's awesome because you guys are the fastest growing ethnic group in the United States, okay? Like, just by far. My people, white folks, you know, we're gonna be, we're gonna be the minority we're going to be a majority minority, all right? But, like, by the way, white people are like 80% of America. Did you know that? Now, we know that ain't true up in California, right? But everywhere else, if you average it out nationwide, 80%, dude, we're going to be like 50% by 2050. Oh, no. Where are we going to go? We'll have to go to the suburbs. We'll have to go to Canada. Right? No, I'm just kidding. Can't go to Clovis anymore to escape. No, we have to uh, basically. I'm so I'm sorry. Okay, forgive my sarcastic humor. I know. <laughs> we'll be fine. Now the great society statistics. Now there's some. Here's the thing though. That scares a lot of people. Like um, in the presidential election. The last one, Mitt Romney, right? Because he ran against Obama in 2012. He got a significant portion of the white vote. Now, guess what vote he didn't get? He didn't get the Latino vote. Okay? Because they're growing um, as a population group. And so the strategy for the Republicans will be very interesting in this next election to see if they can actually get those... Um, get Latinos to vote for them as well as African Americans because Democrats already get like 90% of blacks to, to vote for them. They get 70% of Latinos. So we'll see how it how it pans out. Can they appeal to more diversity? This is beyond the scope of this lecture. I'm sorry. Yeah, go ahead. What do you got? Uh, you don't know how Mm-hmm. Bill Clinton would be vice president? Yeah, absolutely. She won't divorce him. She she should have she could have divorced him years ago for what he did, but she didn't do that. So I think they're going to be fine. The big question is what are we going to call her, Madam President? Yeah, not Mrs. President. We got to call her Madam President. It's going to be awesome. Okay, we're one of the only. If you think it's crazy to have a women female president, think again. We're one of the only industrialized countries on Earth to not have, ever have had a female president. Like, pretty much almost every South American country has had a female president. I mean, Brazil has one. Chile has one. Uh, Great Britain has had one. I think France is like the only one that hasn't had one. She will be. Exactly, and my wife too. <laughs> All right, so the <laughs> here's some interesting stuff about the Great Society. Now, all this government spending on social programs had an impact. It didn't actually eliminate poverty, but here's some cool stats. Before the Great Society, one in five Americans lived in poverty. You might remember that book called The Other America by Michael Harrington, which was written in the 50s, chronicling the cycle of poverty, folks um, 
stuck in a tangled web. 21% of Americans lived in poverty. By 1969, in just 10 years, with all of these anti-government, I'm sorry, anti-poverty programs by the federal government, 12% of them remained below the poverty line. So did it solve poverty? No. Can you ever solve poverty? Heck, Jesus even said, the poor you will always have with you, okay? You know, but seriously, that's a significant decrease. By the way, 2015, it's up again. It's like almost 20, I think it's like 21 or 22 percent again. We, we still have continuous problems with that. Here's some interesting facts about racial divide. Um, 30, uh, 56 percent of blacks were considered poor in 1959. By, 30, by 1969, you have 32 percent. So that's significant didn't eliminate poverty for them. Whites, on the other hand, saw their poverty rates decrease as well. So, again, depending on who you are, you could view this as a failure or a success. You know, if, if you're a Republican, you can go, see, we told you so. You can't eliminate poverty by government spending. I mean, look, whereas... The more liberal you are, you go, yeah, it, it was great, but we could have done more. You know, so that's the nature of politics. You can always look back and say, well, did it work? Uh, twist the numbers however you want to. Um, but those are, those are the overall statistics of President Johnson's Great Society programs. Um, here was the big problem with the Great Society. Um, programs is that what Johnson wanted to do he wanted to end the war in Vietnam quickly okay he wanted the war to be over so that they could take all the money that they were devoting to fighting communism in Vietnam and then transfer it to, to destroy poverty here in the United States that didn't happen of course take a look at this um, quote from Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. I think this is a great quote. He said, Johnson's Great Society was shot down in the battlefields of Vietnam. Just think about that. Was shot down in the battlefields of Vietnam. In other words, he thinks that we could have had a, 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 a destruction of poverty with all the extra money that was being devoted to, to weapons and, and the military. It says old guns versus butter argument. You know, as a society, where are our priorities? Are, us, are our priorities on funding the military? Or is it funding social programs? Where's the balance? Guns, butter. You know, it's kind of like in California where we spend, I think, it's, I think the number is like three times as much on, a, on an inmate house them as we do to seat one child in a public school. We spend far more, you know, when you compare, I think California is one of the last in the nation, like 48th in the nation in terms of like how much money we actually spend per pupil. It's kind of sad. I don't know about community college wise, but I know at the K-12 level that's what that's what it is. So if you look at the statistics, too, in 1966 alone, $1.2 billion was spent on the war on poverty and $22 billion was spent on Vietnam. So, you know, you do the math on this one. The priorities of America on communists, by fighting communism versus fighting poverty here at home. Yeah, it, it, it's important for you to understand that because... There are many historians, including myself, like imagine, just imagine if the United States was never involved in Vietnam, all that $22 billion could have been devoted to, the, to fighting poverty, creating jobs, training people to, to fill those jobs, and perhaps even on more educational opportunities, housing opportunities. It wouldn't be perfect, but it, it's possible that maybe we could have made an even greater dent in, 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 in our society.
society in terms of poverty. And this is Martin Luther King talking. You know, Mar a lot of people don't know this. Martin Luther King was not just a great civil rights leader. He was a great leader for economic justice. You know what that is? When we're talking about a fair, decent wage for people, a, a life where you have the freedom from want, you know, like where you, where a poor person can can live with the basics, you know. Um, he took part in the march in 1968 uh, on Washington D.C. and a different march in which it, the the whole emphasis was on jobs and economic opportunity. It wasn't on civil rights. So, if you go back into the playbook of Martin Luther King and you listen to his speeches, uh, you know, he, he will talk about these sorts of things too. Uh, that economic issues are just as important as civil rights issues. All right, so part three, I'm gonna to try to do this fairly proficiently. Vietnam War affecting American society too. Um, <clears throat> now Vietnam, you guys know why America was involved in Vietnam, right? The answer, con containment of communism. That's the official reason the official reason, but there's been new scholarship that suggests that the real reason we were involved in Vietnam had to do with Vietnam's resources, such as rubber plantations. What can you make from rubber? Tires, erasers, but mostly tires. Okay, so there's economic stuff in Vietnam. However, you can't diminish the fact that stopping communism was obviously a very important thing. I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, it's all good. Okay. Well, of course. You're going psychic like that. Got the sound effect. All right. Now, the Vietnam War is the longest, I'm sorry, costliest war in American history. And um, it's, in some way, the United States is involved ever since the beginning of it. Now, these years that I'm showing you here are from the beginning of the involvement of not only the French, but also the United States. 1975 is when it officially ends for the United States. But the Vietnam War can best be understood um, as, a, well, a couple of different things. Number one. This is Southeast Asia after World War II, right? And you have sort of the same thing as you had in Korea, you know, where you have a northern section of a country that's under the influence of China, right, which is communist, and the southern section of the country, which is not communist. Now, the, the fear was that... Um, North Vietnam had all, already fallen to communism under the leadership of Ho Chi Minh, but the fear was the domino theory, right? That if this country goes communist, the rest of the nations around it would also go communist too. And so what the United States has to do is we, we have to be the ones to stop the domino, right? Now, some interesting stuff is happening in South Vietnam. In South Vietnam, in the late 50s and early 60s, some stuff starts to happen. Um, you have a government in the South Vietnam uh, under the leadership of a guy named Go Dinh Zim, and he's not exactly a true um, Democrat. In other words, like he doesn't really believe in the power of the people. He's kind of a He's kind of a, a, a dictator in a lot of ways. However, he's not communist, so the United States supports him, okay? Um, there's an old phrase in the Cold War, you support people who aren't communist. Now, pardon my French, and when I caption this video, they're gonna have to beep it out. But there's an old phrase that says, you might be, pardon my French, you might, is it, you might, be, he might be a son of a bitch, but he's our son of a bitch. Like, in other words, he's on your team, 